Hi everyone, Robert Kajiwara here. This video is called China's Rise and the End of U.S. Hegemony. This is done in partial completion of the Master of Asian International Affairs program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Over the course of my research, I stumbled across an interesting transcript of a speech that was given by retired United States Ambassador Chas W. Freeman Jr. back in the year 2010. Ambassador Freeman has had quite a prolific career. As a statesman, he is held in high esteem. He is also a fellow at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. What really struck me about Ambassador Freeman is that he takes a pretty neutral and fair approach to China. This is a stark contrast to what a lot of U.S. politicians do today. They take a very anti-China stance. Ambassador Freeman, though, I think is much more fair and neutral and therefore has a more honest and insightful look into China. Although the speech was given in 2010, I think a lot of it is still very relevant to this day, as you'll see. And I think you'll agree with me. It's also interesting to look back uh, over the course of the last 10 years to see how Ambassador Freeman's words hold up to this day to see what came true or what maybe did not come true. I'm not going to read the full speech to you. Instead, I'm just going to read some of the highlights. The Chinese Communist Party has delivered prosperity to ordinary Chinese, which is why it enjoys their support. 86% of Chinese think their country is on the right track. Chinese see proof of the superiority of their political economy in the apparent effectiveness of its response to the financial crash and its aftermath. Their government's policies have so far succeeded in sustaining high rates of economic growth through programs that enhance long-term economic and intellectual competitiveness. The contrast with the muddled self-indulgence of Washington's response to the crisis in particular is striking. The Americans have so far shrunk from the hard decisions necessary to restore fiscal integrity to their government or to reverse serious decay in their nation's human and physical infrastructure. The recession has joined foreign wars and continuing deterioration in relations with the Islamic world as a factor accelerating American decline. These are the words of a retired, very distinguished U.S. ambassador. The financial crash he was talking about was the 2008 financial crash, but it's still very relevant to this day with the whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the financial recession that has resulted from it. In my opinion, China has handled the crisis much much better than the U.S. has. And I think we're going to see results of that both now and in the immediate future. In some ways, China's economy has already surpassed the U.S. And it was originally projected to surpass the U.S. in total GDP by the year 2030. I think it's actually going to happen much, much sooner, simply due to China's effectiveness, particularly given this current pandemic. Some of Ambassador Freeman's other highlights include, it is important to see China as it is not as we wish or fear it to be. Also, China seems certain to emerge from the crisis with a much larger and more competitive economy. And America has already lost its global political hegemony. But for all the reasons I have mentioned, China is neither inclined nor capable of succeeding to this role. That last sentence, I think, is crucial. A lot of people, especially Westerners, have been worried that China is going to replace the U.S. as a hegemon and as an imperialist power that, that bullies and oppresses other countries much the same way that the United States has for generations. Ambassador Freeman, though, does not seem to think this is likely, and I have to agree with him. Ambassador Freeman points out that overall China has been notable for its cautious, defensive, and inward-looking national security posture. One thing I disagree with is Ambassador Freeman's criticism or statement that when he says China's history includes examples of aggressive actions along its borders, especially in Korea and Vietnam, I believe he is talking about the Korean War and the Vietnam War uh, during the mid 20th century. I don't agree with him that this counts as an aggressive action on the part of China. In both these instances, China was only protecting its border and helping its neighbor, Korea and Vietnam respectively. The US had no business getting involved in Korea or Vietnam 
Both countries are very far from its borders, and both these wars went very poorly for the United States. In Korea, of course, it ended up in a stalemate. In Vietnam, uh, the U.S. lost. So China had every right to help its neighbors. I don't think it's fair to say that either of these instances were aggressive actions on the part of China. Ambassador Freeman does, however, seem to compliment China when he points out that China has given diplomacy the decades needed to resolve the Hong Kong and Macau issues without bloodshed. He contrasts this with the way India has treated Goa or the way Indonesia treated East Timor. East Timor, of course, has become an independent nation, due in part to Indonesia's violent ways of dealing with the people of East Timor. During the Cold War, the global economy was essentially bipolar, split between the two main power centers of the Soviet Union and the United States. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the U.S. had hegemonic economic global power throughout the 90s and 2000s. Freeman wrote that during the 2010s, America's hegemonic grip on the world economy will wane, which did in fact come true. Freeman predicted that China will not take America's place as a hegemonic power, but that instead the world will become multipolar with several different power centers at play. So what he means is that yes, China will be an important power center, but so will the US, so will other countries like Russia, India, Brazil, and the EU. I agree with Ambassador Freeman here. I think it's very insightful. China simply has no ambitions to become what the US has been. China has its own China dream. Freeman wrote at a time before the Belt and Road Initiative was officially announced. BRI has essentially connected China to the EU as well as to Russia, Africa, South America, and much of the rest of the world. Given the rise of multiple power centers, Freeman believes that multilateral diplomacy and negotiations will become crucial. And according to Freeman, the United States is not skilled at this type of negotiation, whereas Chinese diplomats have developed a reputation in the international community of being modest and good to work with. It's very interesting to hear a distinguished U.S. ambassador say these things. The U.S. currently has over 800 overseas military bases, costing American taxpayers at least 150 billion dollars per year. U.S. debt is now over 25 trillion dollars. I am predicting that the U.S. is going to have to close many or perhaps all of its overseas military bases in order to fight inflation and to realign its priorities in a way that better benefits the United States and the average citizen. Here in 2020, I believe that China's rise is no longer a challenge to U.S. hegemony. I believe that U.S. hegemony is dead and oppressed peoples around the world are not sad about this at all. Both Iriquans and Hawaiians have long been demanding a return of their independence, respectively. Hawaii was an independent nation up until 1893. It had treaties with many other nations, including the United States. But in 1893, a small group of white American businessmen, the descendants of missionaries, conspired with the United States ambassador to Hawaii, John L. Stevens, to overthrow the rightful Hawaiian Kingdom constitutional monarchy. That is how Hawaii became absorbed by the United States. But the Hawaiian people strongly opposed, and thus a treaty of annexation was never obtained by the United States. So, the annexation of Hawaii is actually illegal according to international law, as well as the United States' own law. Thus, Hawaii remains illegally occupied by the United States and according to international law is not actually part of the United States and never has been. (laughs) Rikyu's history is very similar. Rikyu was a prosperous, peaceful, highly respected independent country. It had treaties with many other nations including the United States, France, the Netherlands. Rikyu had very friendly, close relations with China, Korea, and Southeast Asia. In 1879, Japan invaded and illegally annexed Ryukyu against the will of Ryukyuans. Japan, of course, went on to do the same to much of the rest of East and Southeast Asia. After World War II, though, all of the other countries Japan invaded received back their independence, except for Ryukyu. Instead, the United States military decided to keep Ryukyu for itself to use for military bases. Ryukyuans strongly resisted U.S. military rule and demanded some form of democracy. So, in 1972, the United States gave Ryukyu to Japan, and since then, 
Ryukyu has been under joint occupation by both the US and Japan. So you can see that in both these cases, Hawaii and Ryukyu, neither one has enjoyed US military occupation. The decline of American hegemony, or you could say the decline of the US empire, will probably see a return of independence for both of these countries. America simply cannot afford the high cost that comes with colonization or military occupation. There's a reason why Britain disbanded its empire. The cost of maintaining colonies all over the world is extremely high, and I expect the US will be doing the same very shortly. A question I often hear, though, is will China replace America as an imperial power? And according to Ambassador Freeman, no, China will not. It will be very interesting to see how things play out, not only here in 2020, but in the decade going forward. I'm Robert Kajiwara. Thank you for watching.